This was brought to you by Franklin County Internet Gaming Society on YouTube and Facebook. The ruling arcana of pandemonium are mind and space. The darkest corners of the unconscious mind are readily apparent here, worn like badges, while all roads twist in upon themselves, leading a traveler to the confrontations with his own failings. While Mastigo's warlocks are often associated with di diabolists and demon summoners, those who make deals with the devil, they are more properly the masters of such infernal urges. Those who, by dint of will and command that within them, which is most unsavory. For all men sin, the mastigos learn from the foibles of the mortal coil and use them to attain higher power. Moros. A mage who walks the path of doom, treading the barren wastes and black rivers of the realm of Stygia to attain the watchtower of the lead coin. There are, there is a price to be paid for entering places influenced by Stygia, and there are many toll gates on the road the soul must travel through death to attain new life. This price isn't mundane lucre, but in the treasure reaped by the soul during life. If its weight is light like that of precious metals, the soul can rise above its death. But if it is heavy like lead, the soul must remain in the abode of shades until it can relinquish its hold on life. The ruling arcana of Stygia are death and matter, for it is the place of shells. Whether the hollow shells of egos warm in life or the heavy shells of material greed, whatever is most heavy falls to the influence of this realm. Ghosts who are anchored to the world, they have already left material treasures that distract the soul from its true worth and even darkness, which weighs down the light. Moros necromancers are often stereotyped as pure and quiet, and there are certainly those mages who fit that description. But this image is based more on others' misunderstanding of what mages who work so close to death must be like. If a Morris is gloomy, it is because he is all too aware of the doom that others face while he rises above it all alchemically out transformed by his sojourn in the undiscovered country to which all eventually travel. Abramos, a mage who walks the path of the mighty gliding on celestial winds through the realm of the ether and the Armament of the stars to reach the watchtower of the golden key. Only the elect can enter here, guarded by the hosts with their swords of fire. Lightning strikes any who fly with flag false wings, like Icarus doomed by his hubris. He who would wield the flame Supernal must not flinch in the face of adversity and cleave to one of many visions of the divine. The ruling arcana of the ether are forces and prime. They are very, the very realm bristles with energy, sometimes too much energy, threatening to burn those not shielded by divine purpose. The raw power of the prima 
Materia, the fire of creation that fuels magic, is born here and meted out to the tapestry of Providence. Other mages often fear Obrunus Thurgis for their temperaments as much as their judgmental attitudes. Nonetheless, all admire their strength and call upon them first when the need is dire. Thursus, a mage who walks the path of ecstasy, forging his own trail through the realm of the primal world to discover the watchtower of the stone book. Most of the hallmarks of civilization are but dreams not yet dreamt in this realm, where the world into which mortals were first born thrives in all its teeming grandeur and horror. This place speaks to the primordial of all beings, causing them to lose themselves in ecstasies of the flesh or spirit exalted in the very act of being alive. Some claim that all wine is blessed with the taste of the primal wild, and that those who get madly drunk dance in its humid embrace. A ruling arcana of the primal wild are life and spirit, the pounding dreams of the heart, and lungs, the surging blood in every vein, the tingling nerves and salty sweat. These things are the an alphabet of desire presided over by this realm. Not just flesh, but ephemera too. The instincts of beast and spirit alike are wrought in the primal wilds jungles. Thursus shames. Thursus shamans celebrate the moment and the sheer thrill of existence. Surrounded by presences, they are never alone. There is always a partner ready to take up the dance anew, while some of them are looked upon by other mages as uncivilized louts. They are no hippies. The path of ecstasy is also about pain, for life is there too. Only the dead feel no pain. Thurses are often the first mages sought when the realms invisible intrude. Supernal symbology in modern science, scientific worldview tends to treat ideas as secondary realities, less real than matter. The magical worldview knows that ideas are more real than matter. What is merely a metaphorical idea in the fallen world might well be a literal reality in the supernal world. In other words, the things of the higher world can sometimes be known in the lower world through symbols. Symbols are images or ideas with meaning that can't be exhausted through study or reduced to a single simple concept through logic. Examples are mystical signs like the pentagram and the cross. Likewise, myths and metaphors can, that can refer to supernal things or events. An event recounted in mythology might not have occurred literally in the fallen world where it is a metaphor for the psychic truth, but it might very well have taken place in the supernal world. Mystical symbols speak to the soul, reminding it of its heritage, even if this remembering never rises to conscious awareness for most people. An awakened soul can consciously, consciously engage with a symbol to understand its supernal meaning, the thing that it mirrors. Using symbols in magic strengthens a mage's sympathetic connection to the realm supernal. Indeed, it's part of the modus operandi 
of the art, the reason for the occult's refulgence with mysterious and compelling symbols, signs and images. They speak of the truth of the higher world. Even sleepers pick up the importance of certain symbols and the study of sleeper mythologies and esoterica may yield real truth for those who can distinguish them. Mystical symbology serves as a background for learning the mysteries. Mages are insatiable or insatiably curious about occult knowledge, even ideas seemingly created by sleepers, or in their misunderstood dreams, seek, seek, sleepers can touch upon higher truths. Excavating these truths from the silt of unknowing is a challenge, but one that is rewarding to mages. Occult Correspondence the supernal sometimes seeps into the dreams of sleepers, fertilizing their imaginations with images and metaphors from various supernal realms. These icons are filtered into religion, philosophy, and occult systems the world over. Mages can sometimes discern the supernal truths behind fallen world symbols. And they find that incorporating these sleeper occult systems into their rituals actually aids their magic, strengthening sympathetic ties to watchtowers. Note that the relationship between the supernal realm and mortal religion does not demand a casual link whereby one creates the other. Both phenomena, supernal realms and mortal spirituality seem to influence the other reciprocally. Both phenomena. Below is a short list in some of these correspondences. It's by no means exhaustive and categories sometimes overlap. For example, Haitian voodoo resonates with both the realms of pandemonium, pandemonium and stygia. Mastigo and Morris might incorporate voodoo into their methods of casting as a means of ensuring supernal sympathy. The ether, Abramus, Christian, Gnostic, and the ether, Abramus. The ether, Abramus. Cabalistic symbols, sky gods, Hermes, Thos, Mercury, Norse, Acer, Zoroastrianism, Arcadia, Acanthus, Fairies and Elves, Celtic, Arcadia, Arcanthus, Arcadia, Acanthus, Magical Symbols, Druids, European Witchcraft, Norse, Venere, the Eleusinian Mysteries, Pandemonium, Mastigos, Gosha, Middle Pandemonium, Mastigos, Pandemonium, Mastigos, Eastern Myths of Demons, Zoroastrian Divas, Iblis and the Navs, Asian Voodoo, The Primal Wild, Thursus, Shamanic Cuss, The Primal Wild, Thursus, The Primal Wild, Thursus, Australian Aboriginal Myth, Native American Myth, Candombo, Indigenous Myths the World Over, The Greek Orphic and Dionysian Mysteries, Stygia, Morris, Egyptian and Etruscan Religion, Stygius, Morris, Stygia, Morris, Hades, Greek, Idola, Haitian Voodoo, Certain Forms of Chinese Ancestor Worship, Cabal's Mages are by nature strong-willed and somewhat dogmatic individuals. Consequently, they don't always play well with others. The intense focus and study required 
to learn magic does not foster a great deal of social interaction among the enlightened. At first glance, it seems as though it would be more attractive for a mage to try to go it alone and establish a small sanctum of her own rather than put up with the distraction and competition of interacting with other awakened individuals. Absent of other factors, this would likely be the case, but other factors do play a part. A mage's chances of survival increases enormously when she puts her solitary inclinations aside and works with at least one other awakened. Simultaneously, her chances of descending unchecked into the madness that magical power can cause to drop significantly as well. Most mages join a cabal, a group of other mages, usually peers at the same level of magical development. Nonetheless, some mages work alone. They are called solitaries. If they once had a cabal that broke up or was destroyed, they a reticence to join another gives them a certain amount of respect. Meanwhile, those who never join cabals are distrusted as antisocial freaks when working together. An aggregate of mage is known as a cabal. In common parlance, the word can refer to any small group of individuals but it most commonly denotes a group of conspirators. In the highly politicized world of the awakened, either can apply. Despite their frequent tendencies towards individualism, mages on the whole are intelligent enough to either to realize that they're more likely to achieve their goals if they work in tandem. Any given mage has a slew of reasons to work with his fellow will workers. The balls often have a mystical significance chosen around a theme adherent to a guru. Such symbolic cabals might base their theme on their number of members, the quality of their magical practice, their locale or any other factor that members orders recognize as proper magical correspondences. A cave a cabal might be formed along an elemental theme with one member taking the position of fire, another water, and so on, until all four or five, depending on the paradigm, Elemental roles are filled. Other cabals might use astrology signs or arcana roles as their symbolic unifier, symbolic themes. Some examples of symbolic themes are the four or five elements. Each member of the four or five elements, the four or five elements, the cabal takes the role of an element, earth, air, fire, water, and sometimes spirit. In the east, the elements might be earth, fire, wood, water, and metal. These roles don't simply mean that the member must perform magic using those physical materials. The elements are also conceptual. Earth equals sensation, perception, air equals thought, intelligent or intellect, reason, water equals emotion, instinct, fire equals intuition, will. Astrology members identify themselves with astrology, astrology houses of the zodiac or planets. Alchemy members identify themselves with alchemy, alchemy, certain alchemical substances, gold, lead, or processes. This was brought to you by Franklin County Internet Gaming Society on YouTube and Facebook, Roger Hansen on Patreon, and Gaming with Infamous on Discord. Thanks for stopping by.
Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Inker, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon and check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.